And with that, we are live. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the latest episode of the Tech Forge podcast. I believe this is up to episode 30. Uh-uh. Yeah, the big three, yo. Don't believe you. Don't believe uh, you. We're 30 episodes old. No. <laughs> So we did miss last week due to some technical issues and some due to uh, some scheduling conflicts, but we're back this week and we have brought together the best of the tech news from the last couple of weeks to bring to you fine people. And so (laughs) we are going to get started with the with the tech news. The so first... when you when you close your eyes, is that sarcasm? Uh, you close I your don't eyes. even notice if I do it. You so... close your eyes. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. That, uh, was, uh, so... that was yeah. Go ahead. <clears throat> I'll be nice. off to a great start. Yep. So, our first piece of the tech news. Uh, this originally came out on January the thirty first, but. Uh, Intel has a new CEO. They have brought in interim CEO Robert Swan on as the full-time CEO. Uh, Of course, the last CEO left amidst a cloud of controversy (laughs) as apparently he had been having a uh, what he termed a consensual relationship with someone who was junior to him in the company, which by Intel's own standards is a big no-no. Pinky pinky. (laughs) And so uh, Robert Swan was brought in as the interim CEO. And after several months, he was eventually chosen by the board of directors to be the full-time replacement CEO. Uh, The press release went something like this. Intel Corporation today announced that its board of directors has named Robert Bob Swan as chief executive officer. Swan, 58, who has been serving as Intel's interim CEO for seven months and as chief financial officer since 2016, is the seventh CEO in Intel's 50-year history. Swan has also been elected to Intel's board of directors And there's several more paragraphs of glowing praise of his strong track record. But basically, it's good to see that someone is back at the head of the ship at Intel. Bab. It's Bab. (laughs) Bob is the head of the ship. And so, uh, in some of his past experience, he was an operating partner of General Atlantic LLC. Uh, He was also spent CFO or nine years as CFO of eBay Incorporated. And before that was CFO of Electronic Data Systems Corporation and TRW. So congratulations to Bob Swan on taking the top slot at Intel. Cool. I think he'll do a good job. I think it's a good move. It's a safe pick, pretty much, you know. I mean, it, there were there had been some rumblings for a while that he was basically the choice they were going to go with, but there just hadn't been confirmation yet. This is pro- largely a formality. And then there was that crazy rumor that they were prepared to buy AMD just to get Lisa Sue. Yeah, that yeah. was never right. going to happen. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> the FTC would never let that happen. No. <laughs> Only if Cyrix were still around, maybe. But they'd have to be in a decent position. They'd have to be like where AMD is right now, at least. Pretty much. Uh, This is another one we had left over from last week, but it's an interesting little bit. So uh, it's popular, particularly in the Mac world, to connect external storage via Thunderbolt 3. Uh, It's less popular in the Windows space simply because Thunderbolt 3 is only supported on a very small number of Intel chipsets. And so, uh, Other World Computing, or OWC, has released their new Thunderblade external SSD, which 
they say, quote, offers pro speeds with a price to match. So Otherworld mm -hmm. Computing has uh, released the Thunderblade, which uses, of course, Thunderbolt 3 ports, with external SSD storage for your Macintosh, basically. Mm -hmm. Although, of course, it'll also work with any PC that has Thunderbolt 3 support. Mm -hmm. Uh, the prices, though, prices are kind of expensive. You can get one terabyte of external SSD storage for $799. That's all? And it goes all the way up to an eight terabyte drive. Anyone want to take a wild guess at that price? It's a 2000 or more. Try $3,499. 3500 We're just shy. Yes, you for that price you could get yourself a you know an RTX Titan and have a thousand dollars left over. <laughs> for games. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, the, the the prices sound right out of Mac right out of Apple's uh, price book because they're always super expensive for stuff that you can get in the PC world for cheaper. Mm -hmm. And these are these are NVMe SSDs. Right. Hooked, so up, wanna... hooked up through Thunderbolt 3, which, remember, carries the same amount of bandwidth as a four-time PCIe yeah. uh, time, or a PCIe 3.0 times 4 lane. So it's... The speeds I'm looking at, um, twenty eight hundred megabits per second read, twenty four fifty megabits write, or up to, as it always says, up to. Um, it's like thinking of several NVMe sticks next to. In my mind, it's like. It's like having one of those ASUS or ASRock cards that has four ports for NVMe drives, and you're stacking them and making an enclo uh, external enclosure, and all of them are super expensive, or Samsung 970s or whatever, because Samsung 970 is super fast and super and expensive. Well, and the thing about Thunderbolt 3 is, uh, much like the FireWire technology that preceded it, you can daisy chain Thunderbolt 3 devices. So if you can get the company to pay for, say, six of these things, you could technically daisy chain them all through Thunderbolt 3, then set them up in software in a software RAID array to, as the company puts it, oh God. reach dizzying heights of up to 3,800 megabits per second. For some people, yes. I mean, content creators and, I guess, graphics people, people who work with 4K or 8K files and need to and don't want to like wait. I can understand that, but it just seems excessive in my well, mind. Uh, yeah, 48 terabytes worth of SSD storage would make one heck of a scratch disk. Yeah. So a scratch disk, like putting, what it's is a scratch disk? So uh, in video content creation, a scratch disk is a disk you use specifically to put all the bits and pieces, all the video files and everything that you're using so that you can access it quickly before you compile it into the finished product. Uh, okay. So basically it lets you do all the quote unquote scratch work Okay. It's like putting pages of document in one place and then you're like in a notebook and then you can mm -hmm. put into a paper later, like a term paper or whatever later. Uh, okay. I got gotcha. Basically, yes. So expensive external SSD storage. But so practically. Can yeah, external storage. Uh, Macs have to have in external storage because you can't 
really get into the computers like you can a a non Mac PC. I still believe that a Mac is a PC because a, a Mac not used for business is a personal computer. No matter what Mac fans say, rant and rave, I still believe that if you're using it as a personal content creation, not as a business, it's still a PC. Well, and at this point, Macs are basically just PCs with a different operating system because yeah. they use the x86 architecture. And now, locked mm -hmm. down. And, so, and physically locked down as well as software locked down because they have top-notch security, apparently, supposedly, um, which means you can't really change much. Well, and the... I mean, you could have made an argument that there was a distinct difference between the, you know, the Wintel, as it used to be called, mm. x86 architecture versus with Mac, Mac OS X, the earliest version of it, and Mac OS 9 days where they were still using the PowerPC architecture from IBM. Back then, you know, that was decidedly different, and you could argue that Macs were not PCs because Macs didn't use PC architecture. They didn't use x86. But ever since Apple went to using Intel processors in the mid-2000s, they're basically PCs that run a custom operating system. Yeah. That, well, we could go into, <laughs> that could be a topic in and of itself, talking about how Mac OS X is structured, you know, what the operating systems it's built upon and most of its code base is from. Uh, combination of Unix and BSD, by the way. Mm. But, yeah. That's getting a little far afield from this podcast's uh, area of expertise. So we'll move on with the tech news. Uh, this next one, uh, this next one is a series of things that are less than good for NVIDIA. You know, NVIDIA has had some decent launches of late uh, with the RTX 2060. And while that is, while the pricing on that still miffs me a little bit it's hard to argue with the fact that it is probably the best price to performance of the rtx series but mm -hmm. we could be seeing those prices stay up for quite some time because there was recently an accident at tsmc that wound up in the destruction of quote tens of thousands of nvidia gpu wafers And so uh, the wafer that was being used in their 12 and 16 nanometer processes was contaminated by unqualified raw materials, in their words. Uh. It is estimated that it will lose tens of thousands of wafers, affecting mainly NVIDIA GPU and mobile phone manufacturer chips. And of course, this is uh, this is a this translation is uh, from Chinese into English, and so there may be a little bit of translation error there. But the point being that at some point during this fabrication process, there was a contaminated material introduced into the wafer that caused all of them to be unusable, mm -hmm. uh. and. Tens of thousands of wafers is a significant chunk of a fab's monthly output. It's really unfortunate, to be honest. And so I have a sneaking suspicion that we're not going to see mass availability of RTX cards for some time, if this is any indication. You know, we had hoped that maybe as they got more and more out into the channel and as higher production ramped up, 
maybe the prices would come down a bit. But that does not look like it's going to be the case. Well, it buys more time for potential competition. That's true. And we're going to talk about some of that a little bit later. And so uh, we'll probably see a follow up in the near future discussing, you know, what changes this will make to their 14 and 16 nanometer manufacturing. Of course, uh, it has not interrupted their seven nanometer process. But of course, right now, there's only a couple of different uh, OEMs actually using that fabrication process for seven nanometer, mostly being Samsung and AMD. Right. And Samsung has its own seven nanometer. So, right. They can leverage that fab if they have to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the bad news does not end for NVIDIA there. There's also this recent announcement, uh, just in the last day or so, that SoftBank's Vision Fund has announced that they are selling their entire $3.6 billion stake in NVIDIA. Uh. Now, well, money. I fear that this is not the last of this kind of news that we're going to see because they still are losing value in the stock market. They are still slowly selling, like sales of the RT... RTX? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sales yeah. of the RTX cards are very slow because they are very highly priced and the features that they're based around are not very well supported yet. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, plus all of the other, you know, challenges they've had this year, especially with the, or last year rather, with the, Namely, around the uh, the Bitcoin stuff or the electronic coin stuff, where they over you know they didn't manage their uh, production and stock well, so they ended up with a huge amount of stock of Pascal left over. You know, it, it was great for shoppers, but or gamers, but for their bottom line, it wasn't so. Uh huh. It's it's going to get worse before it gets better for NVIDIA, I fear. Uh, unfortunately, you're probably right. Now, SoftBank originally made this move back in January, but it's only announced on February 6th. Huh. Uh, but the actual, they actually dumped their shares on January the 10th, which amounted to a little bit over 39.8 billion yen which is approximately 3.63 billion US dollars. That's a huge amount of money, man. Yeah. And so this is another financial blow for Nvidia after last month announcing that they had lowered their Q4 revenue guidance because quote deteriorating economic conditions in China as well as quote hitches in sales of its new RTX cards. And that in the past four months, as we talked about two or three weeks back, NVIDIA's stock has lost over half of its value in just four months. It's so, Yeah, it's, it's definitely over half of its value. It's, uh, I've never seen anything quite like it, to be honest. Well, I guess AMD when the FX stuff hit really hard, but I don't know, man. It's, oof, that's, that's a bit of a blow. And like I said, I fear we don't, we're not seeing the end of it. They haven't hit rock bottom yet. They will, but they haven't unless they did change something up, but I don't see that happening. Uh, the one slightly bright spot for NVIDIA is their stock is up almost 3% over the uh, the lowest point. So they have had a tiny uptick. I don't think it'll last. <laughs> eh, we'll they're, see. they're at 147.42 a share. 
and Which... at least last year was like two, almost three hundred a share. Which still one forty seven a share. That's that's pretty insane. Yeah. When you think about it. Let's see. Uh, one little bright spot has been NVIDIA's recent embracing of adaptive sync in free sync monitors. And mm. this comes from PC Gamer. MSI claims 16 free sync monitors are indeed G Sync compatible, even though none of them show up on NVIDIA's listed of certified monitors. <laughs> or NVIDIA's listing of certified monitors, excuse me. Uh, of course, these are all MSI Optics models, which MSI is not quite as well known in the US that it does, in fact, have an MSI Optics monitor line. Yeah. But they have been released, and they do show pretty solid results. Uh, MSI has certified pretty much all of them as G-Sync compatible. Um, okay. They only have two models that aren't, and they're both 24-inch 1080p models. The Optics G24VC and 241VC. Uh, they have one new monitor, the Oculux NXG251R, which is, quote, G-Sync ready, meaning that it does have a built-in G-Sync module. So I will say something we'll talk about a little bit more when we discuss Radeon 7 NVIDIA finally embracing adaptive sync has kind of taken away one of AMD's marketing points from the past where they offered free sync support. Well, now technically NVIDIA does as well. And so maybe that's at the time it didn't seem as big a deal, but with the Radeon 7 launch, Maybe that's a bigger deal than we originally thought. Yeah, maybe. But either way, consumers win because now you don't have to pay the G-Sync tax if you don't want to. Yep. Speaking of taxes, we... Yes? Well, uh, Bluetooth is a technology that has pretty much become an industry standard. But there's always a there's always a bit of a latency penalty when you're using Bluetooth for certain devices. Yes. But with the new Bluetooth 5.1 standard, it's going to include improvements for object tracking and latency. Oh. Yes. So apparently, Bluetooth 5.1 will be able to locate your position within mere inches. No. Yeah. And so, uh, this originally comes from TechSpot, although they are citing the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, which is the group that meets to generate the standards for Bluetooth. So basically, in Bluetooth 5.1 devices, um, they're going to include new technology that allows for better real-time location tracking. Uh, currently, with the current Bluetooth standard, uh, you can use Bluetooth to determine the proximity between two points. But with this new evolution of the standard, the Bluetooth module will be able to take multiple locations and give it even more accurate positioning. I can see that use for a variety of different things. We could have... Bluetooth 
luggage finders. I could also see it in like a if they use if they can use it in a VR headset to track your hands. They already have that, I think, with other stuff. But mm-hmm. so that would for, be cool to demonstrate the concept. They showed a concept of an art museum that uh, has Bluetooth-enabled displays that, as you walk up close with your, say, your Bluetooth phone, it would sync up and give you information about the oh. painting. Oh, that's nice. I like that. That's kind of neat. Uh, they also said that uh, it would be possible to have enhanced information gathering on things like foot traffic through buildings and venues to determine logistics. That'd be good for also good for security. Well, it depends on which end of that you're on. Uh, mm. The fact that they could use your Bluetooth to track where you go in the football stadium is slightly creepy. Yeah, it has privacy issues. Um, but then again, but, from the from an operational logistics standpoint, it's a godsend. Yeah. Where is blah blah blah? It's like, oh, let me check. Let me find out. Oh, here he is. You know, what is our through traffic through? You know, what does our through traffic through our checkout queues look like? Mm-hmm. Huh. Okay. So let's see. And, you know, Bluetooth, it's a useful technology. Of course, as with any technology, when you get something new and you add new features to it, you can misuse it, or it can be used to make things easier. It yeah. is it is a two-edged sword. Yeah. yeah. And what speaking of it... Huh? You know... Yeah, it's wireless. It works with lots of stuff. Me. I guess we'll see. I don't know. So, so, quick question. We technically have two topics that we can take a look at. Do we want to take a look at the AMD topic first, or do we want to talk about the Intel topic first? We can do Intel. Okay. So, uh, this was originally going to be the main topic of our show last week, but... You know, we'll talk about it now, since it is still kind of relevant. Uh, it didn't come out to that much fanfare, but Intel did finally release that 28-core processor that made all of that hubbub back at Computex last year, because it was supposedly a 28-core 5 gigahertz <laughs> processor. No, don't take a look at that thousand, you know, that one horsepower water chiller that we're using to keep it cool. Mm-hmm. However, the processor that was based off of the Xeon W3175X is now available for purchase. Or, sure. well, sort of available for purchase. Basically, the 3175X is a 28-core unlocked workstation processor, uh, as denoted by the fact that it is called a Xeon. And in Intel's press release, they say the Intel Xeon W3175X processor is available today. This unlocked 28-core workstation powerhouse is built for select highly threaded and computing-intensive applications, such as architectural and industrial design and professional content creation. Built for handling heavily threaded applications and tasks, the Intel Xeon W3175X processor delivers uncompromising single and all-core, world-class performance for the most advanced professional creators and their demanding workloads. <laughs> and so, obviously, this is Intel's attempt to answer Threadripper. 
And in some ways, I think it's the answer that was necessary. Now, is it 32 core, 64 thread? No. It's 28 core, 56 thread. But as we, as the reviews came out, it became kind of clear that in certain workloads, the Xeon could keep up and actually beat Threadripper. In other workloads, it was pretty much trading blows. And in others, the Threadripper would completely blow it out. So it's all dependent on what your workload is, as it is with pretty much every workstation task out there. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's take a look at the basic stats of the Xeon W3175X. And for that... Thing's a monster, man. Uh, it is. It's a monster. Going... Let's see. Let me share my screen over here. I saw where Der Bauer had overclocked it, and its power consumption was 1,225 watts. Yes. It was, uh, so, it was crazy. <laughs> so here we have the basic stats for the Intel W3175X. A base clock speed of 3.1 gigahertz. A single core turbo frequency of 4.3 gigahertz, 28 cores, 56 threads, a nominal TDP of 255 watts. And I say nominal because, as you just mentioned, when overclocked, this will easily pull more than 1,000 watts if you let it. Oh, yeah. 38.5 megabytes of Intel smart cache up to 68 PCIe lanes, six channels of DDR4-2666 memory, uh, support for ECC, and here's the kicker, RCP pricing of $2,999. <laughs> Have motherboards finally been released for this thing yet? Uh, technically, there are some motherboards. Uh, okay. The one is the Asus Dominus. Dominus. I know. I was just going to do that. You beat me to the punch. <laughs> gotcha this time. Mm hmm. And so there, there have been some motherboards made available. Um, uh, the Asus Dominus was the one. That I believed. Nope, I stand corrected. PC World for their review used the Gigabyte AX1 motherboard. Hmm. Uh, it was an OnTech that used the Asus Dominus. And so, let's see. Yeah, uh, this is a side by side comparison. This is from PC World. Windows are not wanting to behave. Mm-hmm. Here we are. So, let me present to everyone. You can see they have them compared side by side, the 3175X and the 2990WX. Uh, notice the Intel chip is on the LGA3647 socket. Uh, that is significantly larger even than their uh, high-end desktop enthusiast socket, which is the 2066. The, the critical difference here, I think, though, is with the Threadripper, is it comes down to the price. Yeah. $29.99 versus $17.99. Now, if we go look through some PC World's performance charts here, we see the, the uh, 3175X 
does perform significantly better in certain workloads. Uh, notice they ran Threadripper in two different modes because as we talked about before, Threadripper can act a bit differently depending on how you do memory allocation. Mm -hmm. So we can see it got a bit of a boost when working uh, in what's called NUMA mode. NUMA. But we can see in other workloads, NUMA. 3175X simply blows out the Threadripper part, oh. even though it has fewer cores and threads, thanks to its significantly higher clock speed. And it's on a little bit higher process. Well, that's what that's where Intel in the in this particular space has always had the advantages with clock speed. Yep. Over Threadripper. Yep. And so basically what this allows the 3175X to do is that for large heavily threaded workloads, even though they don't have quite as many threads as Threadripper, yeah. they still are capable of presenting better performance thanks to their higher single core clock speed. And so the 3175X basically represents perhaps not as good of a value as Threadripper. But at this level of performance, you're not looking necessarily for value. You're looking for, I mean, let's face it. The average person is not going to go out and buy a 3175X for their gaming rig. Yeah. If they're buying this processor, they're buying it for use in some specific application that they have it in mind for, whether it's high-end, you know, high-end deep learning AI work, or it's data science, or you know, doing some very high-end content creation, mm -hmm. 3D modeling, CAD. Uh, maybe even something like, uh, I don't know, uh, scientific work involving protein folding. Yeah. I mean, all of these things are things where the 3175X will excel. And so I think with 3175X, the question one must ask is, What is it you want to do? And if the answer is, you know, I'm wanting to put together a high end workstation that has the same amount of processing power as a mid tier server. then that's exactly what the 3175X will let you do. No, what I want to do is I want to hook it up to like three radiators and I want to put Prime 95 on so that in 10 minutes and I will put the radiators in a bucket and then I want to go and when it's turn to Prime 95, I want to go in, get me some chips, come back down and put my feet in the bucket. Because at oh, that time, it's going to be super hot. <laughs> yeah. And my feet's going to feel so good. Mm -mm. Ah. Well, uh, I did like this that uh, Anon Tech pointed out. Uh, the max turbo value under stock clocks for this part is 510 watts. <laughs> That's pretty funny. That's the max, that's the turbo max power value. Meaning that 
if you were to somehow overclock this chip to the point where all the cores were running at their max turbo, then technically you should be hitting right around that 500 watt. And that's what they found. In their testing, they overclocked it to 4.4 gigahertz on all cores with an AVX turbo workload of 4.0 gigahertz. And the system drew 520 watts of power. Mm. It probably didn't take them long with 28 cores, man. Wouldn't take long to get 500 watts at, at uh, some sort of a power virus software like Prime or burn-in test or something. Wouldn't take long. It wouldn't be hard, actually. Yeah. It would be quite easy. And so... Yeah? Basically, uh, there was an interesting paragraph here, again, from the Anantech article. They make the point toward the end that there are no bad products, only bad prices. Yeah. I don't know if I 100% agree with that, but I, I get the idea. You see, originally, the 3175X was going to be priced around 8 k That's $8,000. Wow. Yeah, that thing, that's crazy. You're talking crazy price. It's crazy town. But then Threadripper came along, mm -hmm. and suddenly the price among the OEMs moved down to about $4,500, which is still crazy town, but not quite as much. And now Intel, of course, the recommended consumer price, the RCP pricing, is $2,999. Mm-hmm. And so, at that price, compared to the 9980XE at $2,099, it becomes a decent value for what it is. I mean, consider that for $900 more, what you're getting is 10 additional cores and 20 additional threads over the 9980XE. Hmm. Right. Which, no one's arguing the 9980XE is some kind of value powerhouse, especially when you have Threadripper there costing $300 less. But, if you have something that needs both single and multi-core performance cranked to the hilt, then you would be hard to do wrong with a 3175X. Yep. I would have to agree. Honestly, there's nothing the thing can't do, honestly. It's just, it's way overkill and it's a monster. It is literally a monster. As a CPU, it's a monster. Yeah, I would I would like to see a system with this thing chilled and throw a couple of Vega 64s on there just for oh giggles and see how many power supplies it would actually take. <laughs> um, I could see it taking at least two I could see you putting two thousand watt power supply so think of uh what am i thinking the maybe PC, the pco 11 air case right that thing has a, a fan grid for three three 120s on the top mm -hmm. three 120s on the side three 120s in the front three 120s in the base you can put radiators in all of those places so that's what one two three Four. That's four 360-millimeter radiators. Assuming hmm. you can get the spacing to work. Yes. 
If you can get the spacing and the hosing to work, yes. Uh, so you would probably need something like that. The, and you can mount two power supplies in it. That would be absolute insanity, dude. Yeah, yeah I think you could easily take a pair of 1,200 or 1,600 watt power supplies and nearly max them out using the 3175X and... Uh, we'll skip the Vegas 64 and go straight to, you know, the, the Radeon Instinct MI60s. Still, I mean, you can go to 64s and overclock them and consume around 330, 340 watts. A piece. Yeah. And the scary thing is, is it would take two of those. It would take one and a half of that to match what that CPU can do, can consume, you know, at, at its maximum motherboard setting, right? Right. 500 and something watts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You need to push Vega 64 crazy hard, you know, to get close to that kind of power consumption. I mean, the best I can do on my Vega 56 is nearly 400 watts that's the best i can do so yeah dude you'd need three 360 radi millimeter radiators i'm guessing just to cool that honking hunk of beast right there yep you'd need all of that that's crazy man that yeah, is the absolutely crazy yeah, Intel uh, Intel has unleashed a monster onto the workstation market. And have no doubt that is exactly the market is intended for. Mm -hmm. This is not the CPU for your gaming rig. Although I'm sure it can game just fine. And if you look at some of the benchmarks, yeah, it does it just fine. <laughs> yeah, it does it just fine. $3,000! Does it, Jeff? Fine. <laughs> I mean, the processor alone is the cost of a high-end gaming station, but I mean, if that's what you really want to do with your money and time. Oh, I'm thinking about it. That processor is more expensive than my entire system. <laughs> like everything that I've spent on it. Including all of the high-end water cooling gear and yeah actually it is it's about that much or slightly more hmm. just that processor alone and that's that's my inexperienced idiot idiocy building this water cooling thing and i've gotten all kinds of stuff i don't need man just to have extra stuff. Right. And I'm kind of glad I did, because I've had a couple of explosions recently. Yeah, part of the... Uh, part of last week's um, mishap was due to a, a rather nasty water coolant leak. Yeah, it was my own stupid fault. I was... I didn't like the way the, the, the silly thing drained, because I had my reservoir left or right. And it, of course, is not going to drain very well. So I'm like, hmm, I'll just add a second drain port. Okay. <laughs> no, we're just going to spill all over the place because you're going to mess an O-ring up inside your pushy and feeding. Hmm. Uh, the, the, lovely, wanna, hmm? uh, the, the lovely problems you run into with custom water cooling. Eh, honestly, I'm glad I did run into that problem. Because it forced me to place, to basically rebuild the whole loop and rebend everything. I ended up mounting the reservoir to the back radiator up in an up down config. And for one thing, I love the hose, the hose bends now, or the pipe bends now, but it drains so much better now. It completely drains and it's super easy. Hey, if that's what works. Yeah, yeah, I love the way it looks now. 
So anyway, I didn't want to. I could talk. I could talk for a long time about this thing, but yeah, don't want to. Yeah. By the way, if you want to see his new loop in action, go check out his new YouTube channel, J Town Tech. Yep. Looks really cool. Oh my gosh, man! That I just threw that video up for funsies. <laughs> hey, it's well, up hey, there. Your first content on the channel. Might as well plug it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Welcome. All right, that brings us to other big topic for the week, and this one we'll probably spend a little bit more time on uh, since the the reviews literally dropped today on AMD's latest graphics card, the Radeon 7. Of course, the Radeon 7, famous for being the world's first graphics card implemented on the 7 nanometer process. Uh, in many ways, it is something new and something old. Uh, it's still basically the same architecture used in RX Vega both the 56 and the 64, although it has technically been dubbed Vega 20. Or Vega 2. The, the, the uh, Radeon 7 die uses 60 compute units versus the 56 and 64 of its predecessors, but because of the die shrink due to the move to the 7 nanometer process, that die shrink enabled the addition of two additional packages of HBM2 memory, which is why it features 16 gigabytes of HBM2 memory and a memory bandwidth of one terabyte per second. That's insane. Yeah, that's crazy. So to put it into perspective, right, I've got my current memory speed at uh, one point, basically 1.125 gigahertz for my, for my HBM2. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, let me pull up GPU-Z. GPU-Z states, so my, my memory bus is... 2048 bit, right? Which is half of the 4096 of the uh, Radeon 7. But my bandwidth is at 576 gigabytes a second. So, yep. Which is still insane. But that card is right around twice that, right? So, and that's stock. But. To get the performance that they're trying to achieve, they needed 16 gigs of HBM2 so that they mm -hmm. could have four stacks of of the memory to give them a terabyte a second. Mm -hmm. That's the performance they needed, and that's that's what they got because Vega is memory starved. Like if you're if you're overclocking it, you're going to get severely diminished results unless you overclock the memory too. So. And they readily admit that the 16 gigabytes of HBM2 for gaming applications is probably largely overkill. But remember, this is basically an overhauled version of the Radeon Instinct MI60, or excuse me, the MI50. Right. Uh, the MI60 has a slightly different layout. Anyway, uh, basically, this is a server card that has been repurposed for the gaming market. And in a lot of ways, I would say they succeeded. If you take a look at the Radeon 7, it has that new triple axial fan cooler and that very industrial design to all of it. It's, it's squared off edges. It's, it just looks like it was cut straight out of a solid slab of aluminum and a GPU slapped on it. <laughs> It does look really good. I do I do like that triple axial cooler that they've got on there. And so the first article we linked, and that will include in the links below, 
is to a roundup from WCCF Tech that has links to literally all the Radeon 7 reviews that were live or that have gone live today when we're recording this on February the 7th, 2019. And they have literally dozens of reviews, both video and written reviews. So uh, I do want to take a second to show off this table that helps compare Radeon Vega 7, or Radeon 7, Mm -hmm. with both the Vega 64 and its predecessor, the R9 Fury X. So let's take a look at this table. So uh, notice the process node going from the Fury X to the Vega 64 to Radeon 7 has gone from 28 nanometers to 14 to 7. Mm. Literally transitions transistors one-fourth the size. And we move down from 64 compute units to 60 for Radeon 7. As we'll see, though, this doesn't mean that we have had a commiserate loss in performance. Oh, no, no, no. So, yes, there's only 3,840 stream processors instead of 4,096, but it also means that, Ve that uh, Radeon Vega 7 can hit 1,800 megahertz at its peak clock speed. Hmm. Now, in some of the testing, it was found that it generally stabi stabilizes around 1,750, but technically 1,800s is the peak. Well, to put it into perspective, uh, average average Vega 56 or 64 on liquid. So if you have it decently cooled with a, either a full cover water block or or a, with water of some sort and at least a 240 mil radiator, you can easily get 1650 to 1700 megahertz. So basically what AMD did here is they used the roughly 25% increase in performance moving to the seven nanometer process gave them and decided to use that to crank clock speed rather than improve it, improve power efficiency. Well, that's pretty smart actually. Well, given that, Part of their problem going against NVIDIA has been their relatively low clock speed in comparison. Yep. Yeah, it, I think it was probably the right approach. But that said, it means that Radeon 7 consumes roughly the same power as Vega 64. It's just far more performant doing it. Mm. Well, a big reason for that is the memory bandwidth. Plus, I'm sure they've tweaked a few things in the architecture. But, I mean, that it's interesting. When you look at Vega 56 and at the very same clock speeds as Vega 64, they're, the performance is not that much different. Yeah, the 64 is faster, but they're in the same ballpark. So it, it makes a lot of sense for them to ramp up clock speeds as high as they can. There's going to be people that, that will water cool these, and don't be surprised if they're getting 2 to 2.1 gigahertz out of them. And, dude, at that clock speed, this card's going to be an absolute monster. Yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for modders to get these cards and go to town. Oh, I can't wait to see what someone like Kingpin or DeBauer does with one of these. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. I one of the things I wonder is how good the uh, thermal pad is, because I heard from the review uh, review tech tubers that it has, I think it has a, um, what was it graphite a graphite thermal pad on the die instead of uh, the thermal paste. 
It does have a Hitachi uh, graphite thermal pad, but from what I understand, it's got a higher thermal conductivity rating than this stuff, which the um than this stuff. Oh, which this stuff is this stuff's amazing. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting that at some point. It's really good. I suggest it. But um, supposedly it's it's got higher thermal conductivity than than some of your best performing I, thermal paste out there. I hope that uh, DeBauer does a test between the thermal the stock thermal pad and their thermal pad, like because <clears throat> uh, DeBauer is coming out with a um, like a it looks like a microfiber cloth. And it's supposed to be highly conductive, so probably be better than cryonaut. Maybe so that'll be. Which, which is interesting because, uh, like I think you were going to say, Hunter, several of the reviewers actually disassembled the card to get a look at the graphite thermal pad, mm -hmm. and then, uh, of course, they had to then remove it and replace it with their own thermal paste, mm -hmm. and found changes, some good, some bad, in thermal performance. So mm -hmm. uh, I know Hardware Unboxed and theirs, they actually got slightly better temps with their thermal paste, whereas others got better temps with the thermal pad. So... Yeah, and the difference between the thermal pad and the thermal paste is the thermal paste can go into the crevices, microscopic crevices. On the, like you see a flat uh, CPU cooler base, but the supposedly there's crevices and whatever it, on those that the paste can go everywhere it needs to. Thermal pad just sits on top of a Right, and the argument is that thermal pads sometimes can result in uh, trapped air bubbles that essentially act as powerful insulators. Right? Yeah. But basically, I I'm going to refer to again to a non-text review because, again, they do such a wonderfully thorough job with their work. Uh, I also want to point out something from another review, but here in a minute. Basically, you can go through their gaming tests and everything else they did, but at the end of the day, the Radeon 7 was marketed as being an RTX 2080 competitor. Mm -hmm. And it looks like that's generally the case. But they found that Radeon 7 tended to end up 5 to 6% behind the RTX 2080. Mm-hmm. But something that a lot of the reviewers pointed out was that this was on the press release drivers that they received from AMD, mm -hmm. which are not the same final drivers that are coming out today with the card. And so because they were pre-release drivers, we could see changes in its performance. I think we will see changes. Um, so there, my two takeaways from this really a few more than that, are it's extremely low stock and it's really bad, uh, re, you know, tech review drivers. That um, it's going to perform at the same level, if not better, than the RTX 2080 in games. Now, when it comes to uh, content creation, um it will benefit those that are using OpenCL workloads or and or workloads that go above 8 gigs of VRAM. Right. Yeah. That's really where this thing is going to shine. Uh, if, if you're buying it hoping that it will run CUDA workloads better than the RTX 2080, no. forget about it. That will not happen. It, you're retarded if you... I'm sorry. You're not informed or well learned if you do that but what the did RTX you just did you just pull a patrick soderland i did 
got it. Uh, no, but this this card. So over the past, I mean, the most underappreciated video card that's out there right now is Vega. It's not that bad, people. It really isn't. You can tune it to be, you know, nice with your power supply, or you can tune it to be a monster. That's the beauty of the part. But I think what people will find out is that the Radeon 7 will be better or more performant in most cases than the 2080. We'll just have to and wait for those better drivers to come out, unfortunately. So. And I think the critical thing is... You know, people are going to be, oh, it doesn't beat the 2080. That means it's garbage. Well, no, not necessarily. It beats the 2080 in AMD sponsored titles. Of course, it loses to the 2080 pretty significantly in NVIDIA sponsored titles. And in other titles, they trade blows. Yeah. But, but it's, the same, it's the same with, with uh, their other video card lines, too. You know, exactly. Uh, Polaris and and uh, the fourteen nanometer Vegas. But the thing, the thing that we should do is how does Radeon Seven compare to Vega sixty four? And that's where things get significantly more interesting, at least to me. So Anantech, by their own admission, says that the Radeon Seven performs twenty four percent faster at fourteen forty p and 32% faster at 4K than the Vega 64. Memory. It's the memory bandwidth, mainly. So even though it has fewer... A little bit of clock speed, but mostly memory bandwidth. Even though it has fewer stream processors than the Vega 64, it only has 60 CUs instead of 64, and mm -hmm. 3,840... Uh, stream processors versus 4096 it pulls ahead largely due to the hbm2 memory and the fact that they were able to shrink the die again by that almost a half and giving them a 25 percent performance advantage which at 1440p <clears throat> we see 24 percent faster than vega 64 yep. which it's in margin of error. So reference for reference, this is actually a solid upgrade from Vega 64. It is. Now, and in a vacuum, Radeon 7 would be a huge step forward. The problem is it's not in a vacuum. It's at the same price as the RTX 2080. And if some of the rumors or press are to be believed, AMD is supposedly either um, not making any money or losing a little money on each one. Right. So that would mean that it's a move mainly for mind share. Right. This is a mid-generation kicker until Navi comes out. Yeah. Yeah. In a lot of ways. But... The fact that AMD now has something that can fight at the high end, even if it doesn't fight as well as we had hoped, means there might finally be competition in the high end space. It's nice to see, actually. It's nice to see. I just wish that the other cards had more of an adoption rate. Not sure well, I think in the near future, we'll see, you know, depending on how stock does, mm. I think we'll see Vega 56 and 64, particularly on the used market, start to pick up a bit. Um, you know, Vega 56 is right in line with the RTX 2060 and the GTX 1070 and 1070 Ti. And... It's a you can find it on eBay for anywhere from about two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars, and you can find it on sale new, oftentimes for around three hundred and fifty dollars. 
I'm looking at uh, Power Color Red Dragon right now on Newegg for 320. See, 320. there you go. Vega 56. And remember, Radeon 7 performs about 24% better than Vega 64. Mm -hmm. Immediately, there's not a huge performance gap between Vega 56 and Vega 64. But still, uh, I think the main thing that hurt Vega was the cryptocurrency boom. Because well, yeah, it was it was two it was two things. It was the cryptocurrency boom, which which uh, led to stock and pricing issues, right? And there there just was no available stock at launch, right? So here we have half that issue, and that is a low amount of stock available, at least according to the manufacturers. But you also don't have that pressing cryptocurrency boom. With the insane demand. Yeah, that's true. And uh, I also included a link to something I don't normally link to, and that's the Pharonix page where they did their review of the Radeon 7 in Linux. Hmm. And the reason I included it is because it gives us a very interesting picture of what gaming under OpenGL and Vulkan looks like. I remember Vulkan is basically, uh, gives us a peek into what DirectX 12 performance looks like. Because we know under DirectX 12 and the Vulkan API, Radeon cards tend to generally do pretty well. Be right back. Okay. And so, uh, the critical conclusion they came to was this. Uh, on Ubuntu 18.10 and Fedora 29, the Radeon 7 was able to outperform the RTX 2080 in as many instances as it fell behind. With Vulkan games in particular, when using the Mesa 19.0 Rad V driver. It was it was roughly on par with the 2080. However, uh, with the more common but less official, or excuse me, they used the Rad V, which is the more common but less official AMD Vulkan Linux driver. However, the official driver is AMD VLK, and they have not completed testing on that. And the one thing the Radeon 7 has an advantage over the RTX 2080 in Linux is the Radeon 7's driver is fully open sourced. which means we could see some of those same optimizations moving their way over to Windows with time. Hmm. And so uh, Pharonix is also planning to do reviews of the Radeon 7 on Windows, as well as, like they said, with the AMD VLK driver on Linux. But they did put at the end that it's certainly been a delight benchmarking with this graphics card and it's fully open source and mainline support in time for a launch day and yielding very competitive performance. So one of the things we said was a big issue on Windows was that early press release unstable driver that mm -hmm. seemed to cause wildly inconsistent performance in some games. Uh, in some games, the performance was between the 2070 and the 2080. In other games, it was closer to uh, the t between the 2080 and the 2080 Ti, depending on a number of factors. But in Linux, it was much more stable. It was much more the trading blows we expected. And so 
I think uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at the Pharaonics piece, even if you aren't a person who uses Linux, because I think it gives us a peek into what the future of Radeon 7 will look like. Well, that and there's a there's some games out there that do some really really good uh, asynchronous um, DX12 or Vulkan type workloads. Doom being one of them, but yeah. Doom runs Doom runs like butter on everything. So, <laughs> gosh, what was it? Strange Brigade? I think. Yes. Yeah. Out there, look look at some Strange Brigade uh, benchmarks. Say. I was going to check and see which ones they, which tests they did. So they did, uh, Pharonix did Dirt Rally, F1 2017, uh, F1 2018, uh, the Talos Principle from Devolver Digital, Deus Ex Mankind Divided, Uh, Hitman and Dawn of War 3. Hmm. Really? Oh, and Metro Last Light Redux. Dawn of War 3, huh? Interesting. And so, uh, basically, what I see is this. Right now, the Radeon 7 is trading blows with the RTX 2080, and it's doing so on what are admittedly early and unstable drivers. Mm -hmm. If we look back on AMD's history, when the, uh, when the Fury X initially released, it was competing against the 980 Ti. And that fight uh, did not initially went to the 980 Ti. Today, if you look back at those same cards, the Fury X is ahead. Again, dependent on game, title, what have you. If we look at Vega 64 and compare it to the 1080, Vega 64 is slowly creeping ahead. Again, dependent on title and what have you. Yeah, and it's not hard to make Vega 64 outperform 1080. You can even make a Vega 56 outperform 1080. Mine does. Mine, mine comes slightly ahead of the 1080 on a lot of different benchmarks and games even. Hmm. So, so I think, I think Radeon 7 right now. We're seeing it in... I wish AMD would stop releasing things before they have the drivers ready. Yeah, I mean, it... It puts a sour taste in people's mouth when they read bad drivers from an AMD video card product. Because, because there is an old stereotype about AMD drivers. And yeah, they, and it's... Hey, go ahead. And it exists for a reason, but they have done much better as of late on drivers. And so it, it that's why it was a bit surprising for me to see this kind of slip back to uh, their previous form of bad launch day drivers. Because you remember the Polaris drivers started off pretty well. Yeah. Well, and and if you compare the two, uh, if you compare current AMD driver versus current NVIDIA driver, you get a lot more value out of the AMD driver than you do the NVIDIA driver. Um, I mean, I had a 1070 Ti not too long ago, and I have a Vega 56, and there's a very good reason why I stuck with the Vega 56 over the 1070 Ti. And you know, they traded traded blows all day long. But bottom line is, I just had a much better end user experience with the Vega 56 than I ever did with the 1070 Ti. And I really liked the 1070 Ti, it was a good card. But 
at the end of the day, I just I I thought that the Vega fifty six was better, especially for me being a tinker. So there you go. Hunter, you have any thoughts? Um, no, just same thing that Jason said. Well, that wraps up Radeon 7, so let's take a look at a couple of hardware deals. And, uh, many thanks to Hunter for these. I believe you're the one who found both of these this week. Yeah, I uh, like to look on um, Newegg Flash especially because that's their... Uh, website. I guess that's like their website to try and get rid of um, their uh, product stock, but it's uh, flash sales. So I like that, that they have the flash sale website because they do discount uh, products quite a bit. And our first deal comes from there. It is an AMD Ryzen 5 2600, a six core processor, base clock, 3.4 gigahertz, Max boost clock at 3.9 gigahertz. We've talked about this before. Uh, the Ryzen 5 2600 is a solid processor, even at its base price. But AM, uh, the this AM4 processor, you can now get it for 164.99. And a, and that sale is good for seven days, uh, from uh, now until next Wednesday. And on top of that, you get a free gift in that you get a code for Tom Clancy's The Division 2, which, which is a $60 value. Which now makes me mad because I have a 2600 in my current sleeper build. If I just waited, I could have gotten Division 2, which I really want. <laughs> so if that's a game you wanted... That means at $165, you're essentially getting a Ryzen 5 2600 for $104 and the game. And depending on the cooler, I have seen people talk about online that they have pushed their their uh, 2600 to 4.1 or 4.2 doing overclocking. Well, that's probably some golden silicon, but... Could be. Or Still. could it be like liquid or um, custom loop or even liquid metal on the CPU? All of That's those are scary. possible. Liquid metal scary. Yeah, yeah. If, if it gets on any of the things out around the socket that's not on directly on it and it's it's so crazy how much you use just a because you don't use like a normal size of a P. You use really small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like and a tiny dot. If you use too much, well, that's when you get introduced to the magic smoke. Yeah, yeah. And and you have to basically mate it to to both sides. You got to yeah. mate it to the top. Oh of yeah. Either the the GPU die or the uh, CPU cooler. IHS, and then you've got to make it to the bottom side of the cooler, the cold yeah. plated cooler, and it has yeah. to be exact, like a one for one. So that can be pretty difficult. That it can, but it is is really good. It cuts off a a hard twenty twenty degrees. Well, if done correctly, but. Uh -oh. I think it depends on the application and what it is you're trying to cool. Uh, I mean, the application we've seen it most often used and where I've seen that 20 degree number cited was on the 7980XE, mm. which yeah. on a CPU with 18 cores and 36 threads, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, like a D-lit at Intel something. Yeah, you'll see that kind of a performance differential, especially because you're removing the the stock TIM that Intel puts on there and then even the solder on the 9th series mm -hmm. uh, or in the 9th gen, whatever it is. But if you did that to Ryzen, like if you did, you deleted a soldered Ryzen mm -hmm. and yeah, liquid metal that, you're not really going to see much of, a, a, much of a performance improvement. 
Oh, uh, okay. Uh, you don't accidentally brick the processor in the process. Of yeah, that's true. That's true. However, if you wanted to do a crazy project like that, technically you could do it with the Ryzen 3 2200G or the 2400G mm -hmm. because they are not soldered. Hmm. Yep, but from what I've seen, you're not going to get... You will You will uh, get a big performance or a, a big heat difference, but... If you're overclocking, it doesn't give you that much overclocking headroom, actually. So it, it mostly just gives you dropped temps. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're looking at like lowering fan speeds and stuff like that, it's it's good to do. Or it's good to do just for fun. If you don't mind voiding a warranty. But beyond that, it's not really needed. Or if you can't be bothered with any of that, the Ryzen 5 2600 does come with the AMD right stealth cooler, which for a 65 watt part is more than enough. Yeah, I'm used to that currently until I can, until I get a uh, um, cooler, a different cooler, aftermarket cooler, so I can overclock it. Right on. All right, and that brings us to our last deal of the evening. Uh, this is for the A-Data XPG SX6000 Pro, a 512-gigabyte PCI 3, uh, Gen 3 times 4 lanes, M.2 NVMe SSD. Mm -hmm. uh, it has write speeds up to 2,100 megabits per second, and write speeds of 1,500 megabits per second. And this 512 gigabyte NVMe SSD can be yours for $80. That is, that's a good, that's a really good price for an NVMe that's half a terabyte. That's a good price. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it would make a very solid boot drive. Yeah. Or if you're into the production thing, again, this would make a good scratch disk. Yeah. Or I guess if you wanted a really fast game storage drive, that seems a little excessive, but... Mm -hmm. I, mean, I thought if you about got, having... At $80... That's like the price of a hard disk, hard drive back in the day. I've talked about before how I thought I got a good deal back in Black Friday 2011, 2012 or so when I managed to get a 90 gig SSD, which at that time was still SATA 2, for $100. Yeah. And look how far we've come. Mm -hmm. Now you can get a 512 gigabyte SSD that is 10 times as fast. Well, more like eight times as fast for eighty dollars. Yeah, and that's like um, this is a five hundred gig SSD portable SSD. It's mainly for um, photographers and videographers, but I got it for uh, external storage for games to swap back and forth between computers, and that was like one hundred and ten dollars, even at mm -hmm. Best Buy, which still is. Really, it's cheap for especially external SSD, mm -hmm. or I guess external in probably an M.2 in there, possibly. Kind of seems like it um, would be a SATA M.2, I'd, I'd imagine. But yeah, the it's price not. of storage, the decreasing price of storage is crazy. And so we will make sure to include a link to that down in the description below when this episode finally hits YouTube. In the meantime, that's all the topics we have on the agenda for today. So, gentlemen, anything else you'd like to discuss or add? Mm, no. I'm still working on building my sleeper PC for my 
personal project. So hopefully I'm I'm thinking about doing some more work on it this weekend. So hopefully I'll get it built in some at some point. Yeah, I'll get that cracking in the two fans sent over to you guys soon. Sorry about the delay. Uh, no, we understand. no problem. Stuff happens. I haven't uh, modded my case yet, so because I found out some logistical issues. So hopefully I'll get that straightened out this weekend. Well, let us hope so. And then I'll take pictures of everything I do. Cool. And can we? And uh, I'll be taking that. Uh, I received the part from. I ordered a part from China uh, hmm. a while back. Uh, I mentioned the Dell Optiplex thirty twenty that I was going to upgrade. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, it being a Dell, it does not. It uses a proprietary power connector for its power supply, but mm -hmm. I was able to poke around on eBay and find a adapter that will take a standard 24-pin uh, ATX and turn it into the Dell 8-pin power connector. Mm. Huh. So the main board power is an 8-pin? Uh, it's a custom 8-pin design that is proprietary to Dell. Wow. Gotta so, love proprietary connectors, man. Yep. That's interesting that you're using the Optiplex um, 3020. And so you're not changing anything inside too much. You're just going to... No, the, the probably... main thing I wanted to do was upgrade the power supply so that I could drop either an RX 480 or the GTX 1060 that yeah. I got in there to mainly to see because it uh, the PC itself comes with a Core i5 4590 yeah. and 8 gigs of DDR3, mm -hmm. which for a, a mid-range 1080p graphics card like the RX 480 or the 1060 is pretty much a perfect match. Yeah, yeah. That's weird. <laughs> I've never seen a motherboard power connector less than twenty, less than twenty pins, less than twenty sockets or pins or whatever. Yeah, I yeah. can't say that I have either. At least I can't place it. I was going to say I, I would bring it out and show you all, but uh, we're getting close to the end of the show here, so uh, I suppose I could grab the part itself. But yeah, if you look up the if you look up the 3020 and in particular look at the motherboard diagram, you'll see it does have that weird custom eight pin power connector, which unfortunately is not exclusive to Dell. There's some other manufacturers that use some weird power connectors that are proprietary. It's one of the things I one of the reasons why for if I want to have a pre built that I want to upgrade, a lot of times I'll look at Acer because Acer tends to use standard power supplies. Yeah. So is the 3020 an SFF? I mean, an uh, SSF? No, an MT. Okay, um, cool. A mid-tower. Cool. We should put ours... We should match our... Ours, which ours. Um, that's it. Our mm -hmm. two... Com our two optiplexes can go head to head, <laughs> except mine don't have a twenty six hundred. Right. Uh, yeah, you're doing the whole uh, conversion sleeper, and yeah. I'm just I'm just uh, upgrading a pre built as is. Yeah. And oh. Your twenty six hundred will have roughly a four thread or an eight thread advantage. So. Yeah. Although well, if I can get my hands on a if I can get my hands on a forty seven ninety because uh, unfortunately the motherboard in the the optiplexes can't handle uh, K series processors, mm -hmm. but if I could get my hands on a forty seven ninety or maybe a forty seven ninety T, now that would be interesting. Yeah, forty seven nineties are still a very valid processor, man. 
Oh, yeah. Problem is getting them for a good price. Uh -huh. Those things are still ridiculously priced, man. Yep, yep I've, I was looking at some on uh, eBay, and it's just not not well priced no, for me three, to even do that. Last I checked, there were still three hundred something dollars. I'm like, yeah. come on, guys, really? You can get a twenty six hundred for a hundred and sixty. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so well, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to be with you as we discuss all this tech news. Uh, if you've enjoyed the content this evening, of course, make sure to check the description down below to find links to all the articles that we referenced. You can also find uh, more of our uh, content over on the CrossForge Gaming channel. You can also find some great gaming content over there as well. Uh, make sure to check us out on Twitch five nights a week, Monday through Friday. And I've been Dynamo Ed. This has been TechForge. And remember, when life has you down, Jesus loves you and forge on. Yep.